You're listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Chupp. I don't know if you're aware, but April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. I decided to invite today a physician leader who spent an entire career in the trenches with kids and parents to tell us just how much childhood trauma affects lifelong health. Healthcare professionals are in a unique position to identify child abuse and to intervene to protect those kids. Dr. Joseph Zanga is a specialist in pediatrics and the retired chief of pediatrics for Columbus Regional Health, Columbus Children's Hospital in Columbus, Georgia, and is now living in Sanford, North Carolina. He's a Fordham University and Loyola Medical School grad. Dr. Zanga completed a pediatric residency at the Medical College of Virginia, where he also served as chief resident. For 19 years, Dr. Zanga served as associate professor and then professor of pediatrics and emergency medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University Medical College of Virginia. During that time, he was chair of the Division of General Pediatrics and Emergency Care. He was also the director of Central Virginia Injury Prevention Center, including the Virginia Poison Center, and he was also director of the Child Protection Committee. Dr. Zanga has also served at other institutions as a principal investigator for several federal grants and is author or co-author of over 30 articles, 15 American Academy of Pediatrics publications, 20 book chapters and monographs, and numerous abstracts, reports, and letters to medical journals. During his term as president of the AAP, Dr. Zanga focused on several major issues cogent to our discussion today, including pre-professional education, child abuse and other violence prevention, substance abuse prevention, children and the media, and a host of other topics. He's also promoted the importance of family for the health and well-being of children. Well, no matter what your specialty or experience with adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs as they're called, in kids or adults, I hope that this interview with a past president of both the AAP and the American College of Pediatricians, ACPEDS, will help equip you to recognize the physical manifestations that come from childhood trauma, including emotional and or spiritual sickness. Let's listen in. Well, today it's indeed an incredible privilege for me to welcome to the microphone Dr. Joseph Zanga, who is a past president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AAP, as well as a past president of the American College of Pediatricians, an organization that I believe, Dr. Zanga, that you helped found. Is that correct? That's correct. What time frame were you the president of the AAP? In the early 90s. What led to the formation of ACPEDS? The seminal event was a statement by the American Academy, a policy statement by the American Academy of Pediatrics that said that it was a good thing for homosexual men and women to rear children. The children did wonderfully well in that environment. And a group of pediatricians felt that that was very wrong. Mm -hmm. Worse, I was chair at that time of the AAP's section on bioethics. And in many cases with policy statements, committees that might have an opinion about a statement were asked to review it. And the section on bioethics said, this is not the right statement to make. This is not something that we should support, publish. Uh, The evidence is that this is not right. They published it anyway. So a pediatrician, actually board certified in both pediatrics and internal medicine from Tennessee, Jerry Bocarossa, got interested in trying to put together an organization that might counter some of these uh, growing, this growing number of policy statements by the AAP, which were scientifically incorrect. 
he contacted me because he knew that I was had been president of the academy, and I said, absolutely, this is you know this is something uh, that as chair of the section on bioethics, I had concerns about. We really should look into uh, starting an organization that would deal with science rather than political correctness. So from that, the American College of Pediatricians was born. And certainly the legacy of the AAP as they've continued down that ideological pathway in other areas, for example, transgender identification for children and uh, affirmation as opposed to watchful waiting and support uh, to actually affirm and promote transition. That legacy has continued. Well, I want our listeners to know that the reason that we invited you today to be our guest is that uh, the executive director of American College of Pediatricians, uh, Dr. Michelle Cretella, who's been the executive director for a number of years, had mentioned to me that the theme for this coming year for the college was on the topic of ACEs. And I said, boy, that's playing cards to me. Uh, what are ACEs? And uh, and then she, then she mentioned what, what ACEs are, uh, adverse childhood events. And, and I said, wow, why did you choose that? She said, well, you could probably invite someone to your CMDA Matters podcast, someone like Dr. Joseph Zanga, uh, who's one of our past presidents, because this is an area of a special interest to him. So welcome to the program. And could you just briefly explain why you became interested, Dr. Zanga, in this whole arena of uh, research that's been growing since the late 90s on adverse childhood events. First of all, adverse childhood experiences. Experiences, thank you. You're welcome. It's something that the more I read about it and more and more things were being published in the late 90s and early 2000s, it just rang a bell. The American Academy of Pediatrics was discussing it. The American College of Pediatricians was discussing it. Medical groups in general were discussing it. Even medical groups who weren't dealing directly with children, but were dealing with adults, started looking at this whole question. What does adverse childhood experiences do for the child and the adult that child will become? Mm -hmm. Pediatricians have always recognized that there were things happening in children's lives that were having at least short-term effects on them. One of the things is the, uh, it's probably the primary thing, it's the issue of stress. There are a lot of examples, and the one that I tend to use probably because I lived for a time in New Orleans and went and toured, walked around in the bayous and the, the, the coastal swamps. And, you know, just imagine walking through the swamp and all of a sudden this alligator comes out of the water and is rumbling towards you, mouth open, growling, looking hungry. What do you do? Well, your human instinct is this, this fight or flight. You know, I know they can run faster than me and they're certainly stronger than me. So I don't know what I do. But in the meantime, my heart is pounding, my pulse is racing, my breathing is faster, my blood pressure is up, I'm sweating profusely, and the alligator suddenly turns away and dives back into the water. Wow, what a relief that is. The stress is gone. Now, I'm a child, and every day my parents are yelling and screaming at me. They may be physically abusing me. Daddy is physically abusing mommy. Mommy's physically abusing daddy. They are divorced, separated. I don't know who my father is. All of these things happening on a daily basis cause that same kind of reaction, but it's never relieved. My blood pressure is up. I'm sweating. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. And it happens day after day after day. And it wears the body down. It makes for the background uh, that ultimately produces things like high blood pressure in the adult, heart disease, diabetes, asthma. There are so many things that we are discovering that happen 
in adults that relate to what happened in childhood, adverse childhood experiences. And so we began to start looking at adverse childhood experiences more as a, not a, an individual thing, not just a single entity, not just child abuse, not just food insecurity, but a constellation of things. And there are a lot of surveys, but the standard one is a 10 item adverse childhood experiences, ACEs survey. When you start looking at it, all of us can identify something in there that probably affected us adversely. And gee, you know, maybe as an adult, I'm suffering from some of these things, not because I'm genetically predisposed to them, but maybe I am, but that was enhanced by the adverse childhood experiences I had. The question then became, what do we do with this survey? Do we ask the questions every visit? Actually, probably not. If you have a new patient, new family, it's not a bad idea. Ask the parents of a preschool, young school age child to fill out the adverse childhood experiences survey. And as the American College of Pediatricians, that's one of the things that we're going to be recommending so that we have a, a good baseline to look at the child and talk to the family. We know that four or more adverse childhood experiences is going to contribute to an unhealthy childhood and an unhealthy adulthood. So now we can start working on that. And there's part of the problem. Pediatricians are equipped to work on some of these things. If a child is being physically abused, neglected, emotionally abused, we not only can, but are obligated by ethics and law to report that to the child protective agencies in our respective communities and states. We can deal with that. If there's a family member on drugs, you know, we can recommend counseling for the family member. We can't do it. If there's a family member incarcerated, we can work around that some, but we don't have the skills to advise the family and children the details of the kinds of things they ought to be doing. When there's divorce, separation, death, again, we can advise, and there are some things, for example, well, I guess in the mid to late 90s, one of the foundations said that one of the major problems that children are experiencing is the problem of single parenthood, children growing up in single parent families. Not that it was wrong for a mother of a deceased father to be raising the children, but there are things that we needed to know and do to help the child get through that. By the way, you can't find that study anymore. It disappeared perhaps because it wasn't politically correct. So what do I do? I can refer these children to the family, to a mental health professional. We have a severe shortage of mental health professionals, particularly those who deal with children. Yes, we do. And so that's not an option. Among the things that some pediatricians have done, some physicians who deal with children regularly, there's a pediatrician colleague of mine uh, in uh, Phoenix City, Alabama. I used to be in Columbus, Georgia, right across the river from Phoenix City. She hired a psychologist to work in her office to deal with a number of problems, but most of those problems revolve around the issues in adverse childhood experiences. There are things that we can recommend. The Boys and Girls Club, for example, can be a help to families uh, with single parent household, drug and alcohol abuse, incarceration of a family member. Uh, big brothers and big sisters in some communities can serve in, in loco parentis, uh, in place of a parent, at least in some respects, and give to the child or children the other side of the story. Dr. Zango, in a broad sense, what are the physical manifestations of the emotional trauma that children face in, in their daily lives? 
take the physically abused child or the emotionally abused child, as you watch the interaction, and one of the things that I did, other pediatricians do as well, take a peek in the waiting room sometime and see how the parent in that setting, without us noticeably there, is interacting with the child. Usually because we've suspected from previous visits that something may not be right. And then how are they interacting with the child in the room? It was not uncommon for a parent to, as I'm trying to calm a child uh, who is noticeably scared, maybe they're scared because adults in their lives have scared them. I'm trying to calm the child and mama says, Charlie, you behave. You keep your mouth shut. You sit quietly on that table. And if you don't, I'm going to beat you to a bloody pole. Ooh, that tells me a lot about what's going on in that household and what I need to do. Mm-hmm. Kind of observation is important. And you know, then I examine the child and I see bruises where they shouldn't be. Now I've got to report this to Child Protective Services. So yes, there are things I can do. What would you say about uh, government social policies over the last 20 years or so since this has been on the radar of every pediatrician? What do you think are the things that the government has done in the last 20 years that have been positive, had a positive impact, and those that maybe have not really worked? Now we get into some real heavy political kinds of, of issues. And there's a very interesting documentary film called Uncle Tom which goes into some detail on it. But the great society, uh, the social movements of the 60s, were both a great benefit and a great harm to families, particularly in the lower socioeconomic groups. Yes, we provided food, clothing, housing. We also encouraged the dissolution of families, which has come to haunt those communities. And... The setting up of um, uh, Head Start was a wonderful thing. The promotion of early kindergarten was a good thing. The support for child care centers and the appropriate education training of workers in child care centers, uh, the safety things that need to be put in place, those were all good things to help children to grow up healthier. Uh, So we've got a mixed bag. And unless we start looking at helping to put the family back together, and that's one of the things that's a prime issue with the American College of Pediatricians, is that children grow up best in a male father, female mother, impact, traditional, if you want to call it, family. And they ought to be married. So I'm assuming that you're not in your 20s. That's right. You and I both grew up with and probably achieved some modicum of success because of the family in which we were raised. In addition, there's the resilience questionnaire, which is critically important for the child. My father died when I was in the sixth grade. My mother raised me and my two younger sisters. She didn't do it alone. The extended family was, some of them were walking distance. And so I had uncles help to rear me and teach me, you know, the masculine end of things. And my sisters had not only the, 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 the male uncles, but also some additional female folks to help them along because my mother was tied up supporting the family. That was one of my adverse childhood experiences, mm-hmm. but there were things that caused resilience. I had good teachers at school. Teachers and coaches are important for children who are uh, experiencing 
these adverse childhood experiences. So, you know, there, there are a lot of things that society can do to help these children. Our listeners are, many of them are not involved in counseling or psychiatry. Many are certainly not pediatricians caring for children, but how can Christian healthcare professionals who aren't involved in those things be aware of this tool, become more aware of the tool, and advocate for their patients, keeping in mind the long-term effects of adverse childhood experiences? One of the things I can recommend if they have access to, I don't know who has access to libraries anymore, <laughs> but online, uh, there are a number of articles that they can read about adverse childhood experiences. They can also go to the uh, local bookstores. I think some of them are open. Uh, if not, they can buy it online. Uh, a book called The Deepest Well by uh, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris in California and her uh, awakening to this problem and what she did about it. Very interesting book. Uh, they can read things from the American College of Pediatricians about the importance of two-parent households and issues such as that. And the American College of Pediatricians has a very nice website. Uh, if you just uh, Google American College of Pediatricians and go to their website, you'll get a lot of infer a lot of interesting information about things such as this. You know, it, it's kind of a question of, of uh, keeping your eyes open and being aware and being willing to say something, do something, work with your church on some of these issues involved in adverse childhood experiences. Uh, work with your civic clubs on the same kinds of things. You know, I've, I've spoken to my local Rotary Club about the issue. Anything you can do to raise awareness. And once you get aware, and if you're you know, a reasonably skilled presenter of information to others, advertise yourself to your Chamber of Commerce, to your Boys and Girls Club, to your big brother and sister organizations, to the court system, and say, hey, you need to know more about adverse childhood experiences and about resilience. And I'm happy to come and talk to you about it. Where could our listeners find the educational materials that you referred to? Would that be on ACP's website or a another link? On the American College of Pediatricians website is the best place for them to start to look at the issues involved with talking to your adolescent about, uh, about sex, uh, about the importance of the two-parent family, uh, about adverse childhood experiences, about gender and uh, you know, the fact that uh, you know, you may be able to change your appearance. You cannot change your gender. That's an impossibility. Uh, all of those things are there. They are written in a way that is useful to the health professionals, but also understandable by someone who's not a health professional. And, you know, if there are questions, there are people that we can recommend to Anybody who reads it, who has a question, we can recommend to them people that they can talk to to get answers to their questions. Thank you for sharing with our listeners today and for educating me especially on adverse childhood experiences. And uh, wish you the best this year. And again, remind our listeners to check out the ACPEDS page and uh, this educational material on ACEs. God bless you, Dr. Zanga. You as well. Thank you very much. Well, as Dr. Zanga pointed out, childhood adversity impacts physiology in those kids and can have lifetime consequences. For anyone who's faced a difficult childhood or for healthcare professionals like you who care for kids, the fascinating scientific insight and innovative acclaimed health interventions in the book that Joseph mentioned today, the Deepest Well, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. They represent important hope for preventing lifelong illness for those we love and for our patients and for the generations to come. You can find this book on Amazon or by clicking our link in the show notes today. The deep pain of childhood abuse just doesn't go away. 
even if no physical scars remain as evidence of the victim's suffering, the deep wounds on their minds and hearts and souls are still there. But it is possible to become whole and happy. Author of the successful Healing the Scars of Emotional Abuse, Dr. Gregory Jantz, now helps us as readers to understand the effects of childhood abuse on their emotional, intellectual, physical, relational, and spiritual health. You can get a copy of Healing the Scars of Childhood Abuse at cmda.org store or just by calling us at 888-230-2637 today. Well, if you found yourself intrigued by my conversation with Dr. Zanga today, you might just enjoy the newest installment of our collaborative series with the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. Our next webinar will be live on May 15th, a Saturday, and is titled Neuroscience of the Soul, featuring CMDA member and practicing psychiatrist, Dr. Carl Benzio, who just spoke in our national convention pre-conference sponsored by our psychiatry section. You can register at cmda.org slash events to participate. And you know, if you can't make it on May 15th, you'll still be able to find it later on the CMDA Learning Center, along with more than 80 hours of Category 1 credit CE opportunities. You don't want to miss this. And if you're a member, this is absolutely free online. Well, this coming weekend at the National Convention, CMDA will debut our new training program entitled Faith Prescriptions. This third generation training program is a great resource to help you live out and share your faith in your healthcare practice. If you are a member of CMDA, this brand new resource will be completely free. So just go to cmda.org slash learning, where you will find the homepage of our CMDA Learning Center, and you'll find it right there. We at CMDA would love for you to experience our upcoming Seven Churches of Revelation tour to modern-day Turkey, August 24th through September 3rd. The nation of Turkey combines Old and New Testament history in a unique way and gives you a deeper knowledge of the Bible while giving you a needed reprieve from the busyness of your healthcare practice. You'll be able to join Dr. Jeff Barrows, who's our Senior Vice President for Bioethics and Public Policy, and his wife, Kathy, for this wonderful opportunity of fellowship with other CMDA members and our first CMDA Seven Churches Tour that so many who've been on our past tours have been requesting for several years now. You can find out more information and register for these events I've just mentioned at cmda.org slash events, or you'll find some good, helpful links in our show notes today. The best way to make sure that you don't miss out on any CMDA events is to follow the 1,000 plus members who've already downloaded our new CMDA Go app. Take advantage of all that we have at CMDA to offer to you as a member. Connect with other members, have discussions via forums. We have a new forum on addiction medicine now. Stay up to date with news and events and network with other believers in your specialty. You can look for it on the app store for your specific device. Well, I'm happy to announce that we have a new book of the month through the end of May. Dr. Albert Moeller's book, The Gathering Storm, Secularism, Culture, and the Church. Dr. Moeller, president of Southern Theological Seminary, is one of our featured plenary speakers this weekend during our virtual national convention. And he's been a past guest of mine on CMDA Matters. You can just click our link in the show notes or go to cmda.org slash gathering storm, one word, gathering storm, to receive your copy for a donation to CMDA of any amount today. Thank you. 
Well, I'm sure you know that our Lord Jesus Christ, he showed amazing, deep concern for children during his brief earthly ministry. As Christian healthcare professionals, especially those of you listening who do primary care and regularly see kids in your practice, I know that you share the master's desire to care for the least of these in the way that he did. Our call to imitate Christ and heal the sick is why preventing and or managing adverse childhood experiences matters to CMDA and CMDA matters. Please join me next week as we welcome Christian author Christopher West, who is the co-founder, president, and senior lecturer of the Theology of the Body Institute. Christopher will tell us about his new book, Our Bodies Tell God's Story. I want to thank you for joining me today, and we will see you next week if the Father doesn't send our Lord Jesus back in the meantime. Bye for now. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.